Hello, everyone. It's now after 4.30, so we are going to go ahead and get started. Um, if you're, I hope you saw the first slide, or actually this one says it, right? So if you're looking for this tutorial for the reconciler, you're definitely in the right room. Um, and, uh, you know, so I'll just introduce myself first. Um, I'm Scott Rigby. I'm in the developer experience. I'm a developer experience engineer at Weaveworks. Um, I, um, I am one of the maintainers of Helm. Um, I, co I, maintain, I co maintain the Flux community at uh, Repo, and I um, uh, co chair the GitOps Working Group, and I work with Open GitOps. So that's just a little bit about me. I'm really excited to be presenting um, with these fine fellows. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Amin. I'm an SD at the uh, AWS. I work on AKS and uh, open source and Kubernetes. On my daily work, I write controllers or I write generators for controllers. At maybe if you've been at the, the previous talk. Uh, so, yeah. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Nikki. I'm a software engineer at Weaveworks. I was also a maintainer of AKS CTL. I don't know if you've used it. Um, that's really cool. And I also write controllers currently also. Um, so. I would also say, um, uh, if you're not familiar with the environmental sustainability oh, yeah. technical advisory, the tag within CNCF, please check that out. Nikki's super active in there. And yes. please ask her or any of us questions about that. If you're interested in the energy optimization, carbon optimization for Kubernetes, reach out to me anytime. Hello, uh, my name is Sule. I work for Weavebox as well. Uh, I'm also a Flex maintainer. I'm the, yeah, yeah, I'm working on the controllers for Flex. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sophie Chi. I'm a developer experience engineer at Weavebox. I'm also a maintainer of the notification controller, one of the controllers that make up Block CD. So for most of this stuff, I'll be walking around. Um, if you're following along and you have any issues, you could reach out to me and I'll help out. Thank you. Yeah, so just I think the thing to do, probably raise your hand or whatever if you need any kind of like, hey, this didn't set up correctly or whatever, and one of us will come back. Um, Great, so, okay, so um, this is just a very quick overview of like what's happening today. Um, we're gonna start with, uh, we're starting with like a quick set expectation set, you know, just to let you know like, hey, what, what are we gonna go through? What are you gonna learn? Um, uh, and we are, that includes a very practical and memorable challenge that this demo is set up around. Um, and also like what your final outcome should look like by the end of this. Um, we're, we are gonna, um, we're gonna make sure everyone here can install, well, if you don't want to just listen, you're welcome to just listen. <laughs> but if you don't want, if you want to actually do the hands-on part of it, uh, we'll make sure all of you can set up, uh, install the tutorial prerequisites. Um, we're gonna walk you through setting up a local dev environment, one using one of several methods that we have and just unblock anyone from just like getting in and doing the code. So um, just before the step-by-step -step actual tutorial part, we're going to um, introduce key, very uh, important and less widely known um, uh, concepts and other ways of working with controllers like some of the details around conditions. Um, and uh, really just kind of help just to sort of like help people like be able to envision what we're doing as we're going through the step by step, um, and then we're going to get spend the bulk of our time just getting our hands dirty going through the step by step. Um, we'll have you check out a, a Git repo and and just kind of like check out different branches for each step. So um, yeah, then we'll do a little wrap up and a Q and A. Uh, cool. So. We know that Kubernetes controllers are responsible for making the current state of your Kubernetes cluster continue to, be, to become closer and closer to the desired state. Um, this process is called reconciliation. 
Perhaps you are here because you would like to know how Kubernetes built-in controllers work, or you might want to write your own controller for your custom resources, your CRDs. Um, in this 90-minute tutorial, we'll walk you through building your own controller using controller runtime and Kube Builder. Um, we'll, we'll use Kube Builder, which is a framework for building APIs for custom resource definitions, CRDs. And we'll also explain lesser documented uh, best practices and conventions and concepts for writing controllers that the community has developed through trial and error, through projects such as Flux and Cluster API, also known as CAPI. Um, and after this tutorial, you should walk away with an understanding of what Kubernetes conditions are, how to set and respond to them, and why they matter. And lastly, we'll also look at some common pitfalls and help for libraries that make writing controllers easier and more fun and more reliable. <laughs> so since this tutorial is on how to write a reconciler, we need something for controller to reconcile. And so here's the challenge for today. As a hypothetical KubeCon speaker, in order to have fun and learn things, I want to be able to manage my um, KubeCon proposal submissions declaratively. So we have created a CFP API, a mock call for papers API. Um, the code and docs are in this link, which we'll actually have a link to in the next slides, but also the presentation, you can find it on SCED. So you can find the slides and click on links through there, but we'll also have QR code and bit.ly in a minute. So if you want, you can wait for a sec. Yeah, we'll, po we'll post it up and make sure you all have yeah, it. Yeah, oh. we'll make sure it's there multiple times in the next slides. Um, so yeah, the, we've, we built this mock API to allow us to draft, edit, and finally submit proposals and also create speakers. Um, and there's a, um, yeah, sorry. The API supports a speaker object with a one-to-many um, relationship. So one speaker may be referenced by multiple uh, proposals and each object, each speaker and proposal has multiple uh, required and a few optional fields that we'll look at. And our challenge today is to write a Kubernetes controller that defines CRDs for both the speaker and proposal and a reconciler for each of those resources. Yeah, and just to be clear, um, I hope everybody knows this, but this API doesn't really exist, so I hope, I hope uh, Linux Foundation doesn't get um, complaints that they can't submit their CFPs through an API or do it declaratively. This is just uh, to help kind of get your mind around an example. Um, so in order to run the controllers in your local machine, uh, we have prepared uh, multiple methods and techniques for you to uh, uh, spin the, or develop the controllers. So uh, Santoshi and I will be available um, in the room, if you have any problems uh, for your setup or with the compilation or anything like that, please just wave at us and welcome uh, to help you out. And so the repository can be found at this bit.ly. Um, you can also scan this QR, get the link. You can send it to yourself. <laughs> um, yeah, if you get this, get away from the speaker. Get this link. Um, and also the name of the repo is at the bottom, so it's the title of the session, um, how to write a reconciler using Kubernetes controller runtime. Just waiting a few awkward seconds to make sure everyone has it. Yeah, maybe just give a, sec uh, a little bit for people to, to hit it. Yep. And again, if you need it again, we'll put the slide back up and get it. Yeah, the link is still at the very top there, so you can listen and get the link too. Um, so we have prepared four different, four different ways of you to um, do this tutorial with us. Uh, the first one, of course, is you can just watch and learn and uh, see uh, 
what Sule will be presenting in, in a few minutes from now. Uh, our second method and the easiest one, if you don't have any development environments on your machine, is a Git pod link. It's going to spin up um, a VS Code or a Golang environment for you with everything ready in there. Uh, don't forget, if you ever see a password prompt, uh, it's root root. Uh, username is root, password is root. Uh, we also have a background file. If you're a fan of virtual machines and you already have uh, something to spin a virtual machine or the background tool, please go ahead and use the background file. You're gonna find it in. Um, you're gonna find the instructions in the readme file. And of course, uh, for the bravest of you, you can go ahead. If you already have Go kind, Docker and customize, you already are like set to go and you can just uh, follow the tutorial directly. I mean, honestly, I think this might be the easiest for folks because if you have these on your computer, or at least if you have most of these dependencies, it'll run faster. Um, but, uh, but yeah, the Git, the Git pod should be nice because you, for anyone who might not have them, the dependencies. So the Git pod one might take seven to eight minutes to spin a K3S cluster for you. So if you want to go for that technique, please spin it right now, or at least click on the button right now. And uh, yeah, you should be fine in a few minutes. Yeah, do you all see where, um, maybe we should put up uh, the readme, um, or, or actually rather, so this open in Gitpod, there's a button on the readme link, so yeah, maybe we'll just go back right just a second for the, um, yeah, uh, so for those who want to do it, at least open up the repo so that you'll have that option. I myself tried to spin up um, a GitPod cluster and I was not able to do it, but others were. So um, just let us know if you have any trouble. All right, cool. Okay, right. hey, you want me to introduce this part for you? Is that my computer? Oh, no, like no we had switched it up so that we could look at uh, speaker notes. Here we go. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, Sule is going to show, there you go, you got it? A quick demo of basically what, what you'll see in a little bit as you go through the demo yourself and what it should look like at the end. Um, uh, so we have a make file here uh, that you can use to bigger. Like this, okay. We have a make file that you can use to set up a kind cluster and then to, de to deploy everything uh, in the cluster. So that I have already done. Sorry, just uh, real quick. Can everybody read it or does it need to go bigger? Bigger. Make it bigger. Uh, like this? Yeah, I was thinking more. I'm seeing hands saying more. Is that, is that readable? Okay, so, okay, cool. okay. Um, so I, I have already uh, set it, so I have a cluster running, a kind cluster running, and here you can see that the, the controller is running in the namespace CFP system. Um, I got the API that is running in the namespace CFP. Right. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to install the samples customer services definition that we have here. So we're going to install a speaker and then we're going to install uh, to deploy sorry, a proposal. So let's do that. First we apply the speaker. And we describe the speaker. So what it has done is that we have a new speaker, so the controller is going to uh, make a call on the API and create a speaker. And then we have a condition telling you what is the status of the speaker. So the speaker has been uh, reconciled successfully and we have an ID for this speaker that is called default speaker sample. So the ID is the namespace dash the name of the speaker. Uh, so now let's apply a proposal. So, just play this by proposal. And we describe the proposal. 
So here's the same, you have a proposal. We do an IPA call uh, to, deep, to, to create a new proposal, and what this tells us that we have a new proposal last updated uh, just now, and that the submission is uh, draft. So I'm going to edit this proposal and change the submission status, uh, if I find it, here to final. Now I describe it again. So wait a little bit because uh, now that I've, I have edited it, the controller has to reconcile it and then uh, it's going to make an APA call and it will make it final. Taking some time here. What's, what's happening here as I edited the API servers is supposed to create an event. That's not happening for now. Still in draft. Did I edit it as supposed to? Sorry? I didn't quite. I didn't quite hear that. Did you? Did you get that? You're editing the one on status. Should be. Should be something You're editing the one on status. Yeah. You're editing. The spec. Oh, oh, oh! I, I think I. Oh, I did. Oh, yeah. That's true. Editing the, st the the actual status. Yeah, I, I see. Itself. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Yay! Yeah, I'm a little bit stressed. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, now I have edited the spec. Absolutely. Yeah, I yeah. describe it. Yeah, now it's back to final. As supposed to. The other thing is if I delete the, the speaker, what I will get in the proposal is that we have new conditions that are telling us that you cannot reconcile the proposal now because the speaker doesn't, doesn't exist anymore. Right? That was it. Up for the demo. Okay. Well, awesome. Yeah, so um, that just gives you a sense of what, what, it should, what it should do in the end. And we also have test cases that you can see that explain exactly what, um, what should happen. And we'll, we have a, the make file that, with some make commands that you can just run yourself and we'll show you uh, what each of those tests will do. Um, oh, thanks. I'm going to get a milk crate here for, okay, cool. Um, yeah, so, okay, so we, I promised that we would uh, introduce some of the lesser known concepts um, that we're gonna see throughout this tutorial. Um, some are very well known, some are not as known. Um, some of you might know all of them and some of you may know none of them, so that's why we're gonna go over these. And there's just uh, five of them. So, um, uh, it is, it is the fact, it is the case that this tutorial is an intermediate tutorial, so it assumes some knowledge of Kubernetes. But I would say if anybody is in here kind of wondering, what's this all about? Um, I do encourage you to check out the CNCF glossary. It's just glossary.cncf.io, where those concepts are, are spelled out for anyone just approaching some of those for the first time. Like, what is a Kubernetes cluster and things like that. Um, yeah. So. Um, so, I'm going to talk about reconciliation, which is at the center of Kubernetes group. Um, so, the Kubernetes community repo, if you haven't checked out the community repo of Kubernetes, have a look. It's full of great guides on how to build different things. There's also a great guide on controllers for developers that's been around since like forever. Um, and that has a list of best practices and information about how to build controllers. But there's a catch. So first, as written in these docs, 
a Kubernetes controller actively reconciles resources. What that means is that a reconciler watches an object for crude operations, create, update, delete, etc. And then it compares the desired state of the world with the actual state. And then it applies some logic to match the desired state with the current state. And the simplest implementation of this control loop is this, is this, lo this loop right here, right, that we see on the screen. But in practice, things are not that simple. Um, today, we have built-in controllers for the default Kubernetes resources, deployments, uh, etc. The scheduler is a controller, um, an operator is a controller, and we have controllers for CRDs as well. So the, the Kubernetes, back to the Kubernetes developer guide on controllers, it's really great for learning how to build the controller from scratch for built-in resources that you can find um, easily without having to build any scaffolding around these resources, like deployments, for example. Um, and it doesn't make use of scaffolding libraries such as KubeBuilder. Um, in essence, as you can see, if, if you've opened up the, 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 the guide, you initialize a controller struct that reads from a cache um, of resources, you then have to list and watch a specific resource with the watcher method. Um, then you use an informer to retrieve information about the resource that you are watching. Um, then you handle some of the logic for the events um, that the create update, the crude events that are, that are occurring. And then you reconcile, you resync, and you handle um, graceful shutdowns and errors. This is relatively straightforward for common Kubernetes resources, again, like deployments and pods, but it becomes harder for custom resources, right? Um, and this is where KubeBuilder really shines. And this is what we're going to be looking at today. And first, Amin, what is the controller runtime framework? Thank you. So during this tutorial, we're going to be building controllers using controller runtime. Um, but before diving into controller runtime, let's take a look at how native controllers like deployment and replica set are built. Uh, so initially, they were built using core components like informers, shared informers, listers, and work queues. At the, at the left of this schema, you're going to see that we have the deployment informer, replica set informer, and pod informers. Those are Kubernetes components that will register what we call the, the event handlers. So whenever you create a deployment or a replica set or a pod, these informers will catch this uh, event and apply one of those functions. When, when those functions are applied, uh, they're gonna, we're going to send uh, the object to the, to the worker queue where they're going to be processed later by a manager. The manager on the right is a component that will execute the reconciliation function, which will move your object from the latest, or try to move your object from the latest to the desired state. Um, controller Runtime is a set of Go, library, uh, Go libraries uh, for builder controllers. It simplifies a lot of things. Um, it is a product of years of experience building controllers. We've learned a lot from uh, building native controllers like deployment and uh, stateful set, and we try to create controller runtime, and that's what we're going to use today. It also hides the complexity of building controllers. For example, during this tutorial, we're not going to see what is a shared informer or what is a lister. We're going to use directly components that will simplify all this um, um, pipeline for us. 
Uh, it allows you also to focus on the logic of the sync function. It means that you will not have to deal with any events or any specific functions. You just focus on how do I move my objects from the latest to the desired state. It is well tested and maintained. Of course, it's open source. Um, it's a very good read if you ever um, want to go and see how it's built inside. And just a few examples on, on what are you going to find in this library. As for example, there is pkg slash log. It's for standardized login. Uh, so you will not have to import anything about login. Everything is built in there regarding verbosity and um, debugging stuff. There's also the leader election. So uh, if you ever heard that but controllers can also have the leader election mechanism, you can have multiple controllers uh, trying to fight or like to get the responsibility of managing your resources. You don't have to build that yourself. There is the PKG slash leader election. Um, there is also a library to manage webhooks, um, validation webhooks, mutation webhooks, and other things like rate limiting and um, testing. For example, whenever you want to test your controller, you either can do unit testing or spin a real kind cluster or a real Kubernetes cluster to test your controller or you can use pkg slash env tests that provide you a very similar envi Kubernetes environment that is not really a real, real one, but can be used for testing purposes. Uh, so we, uh, we are going to use KeepBuilder for, for our, um, our project here. KeepBuilder is a framework that uses control runtime actually, and then it, it, it builds, actually there's a scaffolding that builds all the project for you. And then you really have only to, to focus on implementing your controller logic. So there is a KeepBuilder in it, and KeepBuilder create API that you can use to build the project and have all the APIs set, set up for you. There are other frameworks, uh, other frameworks that exist, including the operator framework, and you have Knative as well that do that. You can go to the KeyBuilder book if you want to know more about that. Um, so let's talk about conditions. Uh, as we showed during the demo, uh, you can have condition set in the status of uh, your custom resource. The conditions are a set of types. So you can have ready, uh, ready condition, post schedule, for example. And if each type has a status, and the condition represents the current state of your custom resource. So it is computed and it can be recomputed every time. You don't have to, to store it anyway. Any, any, Anyway, um, you use the condition actually to communicate the state of custom issues between different uh, controllers. For example, if you have one consuming controller, one producing controller, and one consuming controller, you can use the conditions to know the current state of the custom resource. The, the conditions will be uh, set in an abnormal true polarity. To give an example, uh, when in our project we do uh, a call to fetch a speaker, if the call doesn't succeed for any network uh, reason, we can have a condition that we call fetch fail condition, and it will be fetch fail true. And we say abnormal true because those conditions are supposed to be on the customer side only when something not normal happens. Otherwise, you, you, can, you should not have them. Yeah, I, I can take this one if that's cool. cool. Yeah, unless you want to do no, that. No, no. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so basically how to, there's this cool, uh, how many of you know about observe generation or work with that at all um, in your day to day or ever? Yeah, okay, so a few hands. It's a really good thing to know, just like conditions are, right? So basically, um, the custom resource definitions are supposed to set a field called observe generation in the status object. Um, this is already what built-in Kubernetes um, resource types do. But um, the controller, the, your controller that you're building, um, and the one that we set up as a step-by-step as a -step for you, um, should update that field um, every time it sees a new generation of the resource. Um, basically, the point of it is to, to allow the controller to, to be able to tell the difference between resources that, um, that don't have any conditions set because um, they're already fully reconciled from resources that don't have any conditions set because they've just been created or aren't quite, quite there yet. 
So that um, is very helpful. And um, if you've ever used controllers that don't do that, there's often lots of ed ca edge cases, race conditions, and different things where that are pretty hard to reproduce. Um, this is something that was introduced into Kubernetes a while back to help solve those use cases. So we're right on time, no. actually. Yeah. Great. Does anyone no. need the link Probably. to the repo again so we can go back? Or <laughs> no. no? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Okay. We'll braid. We'll braid these every time we switch. So oh, yes, you were asking if anybody. Yeah, needed if everyone help? is okay with the dev environment before we start uh, with the step-by-step -step guide. And it's a co okay to just yeah. watch too, but okay, yeah. great. Any issues? Just raise your hand. And, yeah. Great. Uh, so, so the step by step, so we have, so we have, we have written all the controllers actually, and we have set tags for every step of, of the um, writing the controller process. So, on the step one is just to uh, use the tag S1 for step one and create a branch uh, for, from that. And I'll do this that. I think I have a branch already. We need to add the login for. Yeah, we said it's root, root. Okay. Yeah, oh, real quick. Has everybody yeah. checked out the, yeah. the Git repo yeah. Yeah. that was on that QR code? Um, okay, cool. Uh, yes. Oh, you have done it. Okay, cool. Uh, great. Um, yeah, so the password, okay. it's. Password. Yeah. Super secure password. Uh, root, root. <laughs> Username root, password root. <clears throat> Never do that. <laughs> so as Sule is going through these, through these steps, you can also, if you want to compare um, for the workshop and just look, check out the workshop branch and look at the commits. Each commit tells exactly, the, the commits were separated, pretty well separated, so, or actually very well separated, so that each commit shows um, what step by step, what's done step by step, and those correspond to the to the tags that Sule will guide you through checking out. Okay, now that we are on the first step, something to know is that uh, we have a test target in the make file that is going to generate the manifest for you, and then going to run the API for you, and then is going to run all the individual you need tests that you have, and then at the end is the, the clean API. So this is, it is doing this locally, either in Git pod or your own local environment. So one API is uh, actually going to run uh, the API mended go, uh, and the clean API is going to kill the process and uh, clean up every data that has been created. So what do we have here? So we use Keep Builder. We did Keep Builder in it for, um, beforehand, and then we could, we uh, we have written all the controller from there. Uh, so we have a speaker, custom message definition. So what we have inside is we have a spec, so the name, the the bio, and the email of the speaker, and we use Keep Builder markers that you can see here to add some validations. So the, the name has to be a string. The email has to follow some regex pattern here. Then we have the status, and in the status we have the observed generation, the ID, and a set of, uh, some, uh, set of conditions. You can see that all of them are optional. So at the beginning we won't have any ID, any conditions, and then we can, through the reconciliation process, we can add those. And then what we have here is set by Keep Builder to the speaker has to uh, implement type meter and uh, object meter. Those are, in object meter, you can see that we have the kind and the API version. And in type meter, you have the names in namespace. And other, uh, the names in namespace and other uh, fields that you have to, to implement. So that's it for the reconciler. Let's move on. 
So what uh, KeyBuilder does for us as well is to generate the series uh, and the manifest actually to deploy our controllers. So if you haven't used KeyBuilder, um, most of what you see, the scaffolding was generated by KubeBuilder um, and it's a, probably should, yeah, we can add the command, anyway, it's okay. Well, we do actually have the commands we have um, in inside the of, yeah, inside, not in the readme, but um, the readme shows, the readme of the Git repo shows how the code is organized, where the CFP API is that we've made as a dummy API, and then where the, um, uh, and then the, the CFP folder, it's named that way because um, it needs to be named for, for your uh, controller. Inside of, inside of that, there's the steps that we used okay. to generate. So right. if you want to go back and say, oh, how did they do that? You could, okay. yeah. So most of it, most of it, 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 it was generated by KubeBuilder and just the, the initialization command. Um, and most of the work that we will do will be in the reconcile function that we will see in a minute. Great. Uh, what we have here uh, in internal CFP is, so we should show this, we have a client and uh, what the client is doing is, is actually just an HTTP client that is going to uh, call the API uh, in order to create update, well do create operation on the speaker's endpoint on the, on the proposal endpoint. That's, this is the API we will be using in, in our controllers. Can see that here. And now, if you look at main, so this is where everything is set up. Uh, so we have a scheme that is set up. The scheme, uh, what the scheme is doing is the scheme is, is actually the interface that is permitting you to uh, to match the REST API or KB API server where you have uh, your custom resources and the Go type that you have in your controller. So in order uh, for controller runtime and client go under, under controller runtime to go fetch those, uh, those, um, those objects from the Kube API server, it's because client go is using Go types, it needs a way from those Go type and the uh, Go version kind you have for your Go type to be able to find the, the, the endpoint on the West API to call the Kube API server. And the scheme is the, what's giving you that. So you create uh, your type and you, um, you set your type in this, in this scheme, I will see. Uh, so what we have here, we have some flags. The first two ones are set by Kubilla first. So this is the metric address for metrics and a pub is for the health checks that we have. And we, we, we have added a flag here that we called a CP API endpoint address, and this is the endpoint, uh, the, the endpoint address of, the, of, the, of the, the API that we have written. And the default is localhost with the port. We don't enable leader election at all here because, um, well, we could, we could, but we have only one running part, one running and sense of our controller, so we don't need leader election here. Um, so then what we do is we create a new manager. As I mean, I said, the, the, we have a manager that manages controllers. So the, managers, the manager does a lot of things for us. It's going to create caches and formers for us and set watches to the KBBI server so we can see when, so we can get events when new objects are created or objects are updated. And then it's managed our controller life cycle and it's uh, when we have new events, it's forward those events to our controller through the queue. And then we, we declare our two speakers, uh, two reconciler. We have a speaker reconciler that we are talking about now. And then we will have the proposal reconciler. And we set them with the manager of the controller. And that that's it. Uh, now let's talk about the controllers. The controllers themselves, so what we did 
is we, we, we have a suit test that is set up. So what the, yeah, something we didn't say is that we use the Flux uh, SDK here because, uh, well, we, we work on Flux mostly and we use those, uh, we use Flux uh, SDK because on the Flux SDK we have many things that we learn to uh, writing uh, controllers that we set in, in, in the package in Flex SDK that make it easier for us to write our controller. And we think that, well, you, you can use those because it's really make it easier as we will see, or you can write your own uh, function to help us. One thing I wanted to do that I didn't do is have a slide right about here where it shows the like thousand lines of code from the, uh, the, the handwritten um, <laughs> in order to, to work with conditions um, for, for the KubeBuilder tutorial versus using in the Flux package where it's really just a few lines. Um, we can explain what they do, but I think that the function, the package, the Flux CD package runtime controller package um, has, uh, it's semantically written, so it should kind of tell you as you're writing it and as you see the, the statements what it's actually doing. But if any of that's unclear, just, just ask us and we can also, link to it. Does anyone have any questions or so far or is not following or anything at all? I guess I have a question around the computer election being done. You know, why are we just applying the static identifier? Can you take the mic? The mic I'm sorry. Oh. Uh -huh. So I just had a question around. Oh, you've got your mask on still. Check, check, oh. check. I just had a question around the leader election ID in main.go and why that was being set to a static value. Um, I'm curious if there is, say, like another instance of this operator that started up, um, wouldn't that, like, I guess, how does that work? And, like, wouldn't they need unique identifiers? I'm, just, I'm sorry. Oh, he's asking. That, or if I if I heard you right, the the static ID for the leader election. He's asking why we set a static ID and what would happen if you were to oh, okay. install multiple instances of this. Yep, I can do that. So you're talking about this? Yeah. Uh, when we're did did I get that right? This one. Yes, can, right. Okay, okay. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so. What we do with the, with the leader election is when we have diff to several instances of a, of a given controller, like we have a, a speaker controller here, we, we, we only have one pod, but we have several pods, we have several instances, and they're supposed to do uh, the same job. So they need some kind of synchronization between them to know uh, when a given object uh, is coming, how to reconcile that object, and to make sure that two uh, those two or several instances don't, do not do the same job. So what uh, community does here is that we have uh, an ID, and the ID is going to be uh, hold, uh, held by uh, a list object. And when uh, the list um, election app uh, is happening, it is using a wrapped under the hood. I don't know if you know about wrapped. The wrapped project, you know about this? Right. Well, it's a standard for. Uh, are, are you familiar with Raft, or do we? Yeah. Right, I thought so because you asked that question. Okay. Yeah. So he's doing this, and um, so and all the all the instances are going to use Raft in order to to, to try to get uh, to be elected leader, and the one that is elected leader is going to have the lease and it's holding the lease un until uh, it's crashed or something like this, and there is. Um, uh, how do you call it? Uh, a health check that is done every a given amount of time to check whether the leader is still active and he still he still is a leader. And if it, uh, and the leader has to respond when the health check is done, say okay, I'm still leader, I'm still active. And when it's not active, a, a new leader election happens, and a new object can get to be the leader. And uh, we have also this leader election release and cancel that can be set. So control runtime time can say. Um, okay, at some point this leader crash, crashed, and so we can't sell it, and we, we do some cleanup. I've never used it actually. We don't use it. Yeah, we just we just didn't need to show that for for this part, so we just commented that stuff out. <laughs> All right.
Thanks. Uh, so coming back to the test. Uh, sorry. There's another question. Yeah. I could take probably one of the mics too. Oh, just need help. Okay. Um, so on the test, what, what we use is we use um, the test, uh, the, the AMP test that, that is provided by uh, the Kubernetes SIG. Uh, that is uh, actually that is uh, that is generating a test environment for us that we can with a with real Kube API server that we can use to run our, our test. Uh, we use this. Uh, we have a wrapper around this that is uh, the Flux test AMP here. This, so this is from Flux runtime test time. What this does is giving us nice helper functions in order to, when we create a given object uh, to the API server, we can wait to make sure that this, uh, this object has been created, for example. So we set um, uh, the API endpoint, and then we, generate, we, we create our reconciler here, and then we start. Uh, this test environment, and at the end, we stop this test environment and we clean up. That's what it's doing for us. So now, if you talk, um, so for the reconciler, we have a test case here. So for every, for every test case, what we do, we have a name, a speaker, a bio, an email, and some conditions that has to be asserted against. And we pass those conditions to an asset function. So the first test case is uh, to create a speaker and to reconcile it. So we create a speaker named Luke Skywalker. Uh, we set the, uh, the bio to first speaker bio, and we set an email to first at portalmail.com. And the condition that we expect here is that, uh, that the ready condition is to succeed it with the reconcile, with uh, a name of the reconcile of the object that has been reconciled to successfully. Should we have everyone check out the step one branch yep. for creating a speaker? Yep. Okay. But we said that the, everyone is on, uh, everyone has checked the, the, the tag on S1 and has created a branch from that? Okay. Yeah, not yet. Um, That's how you do this. You do type git checkout tags S1, dash B S1 branch. Oh yeah, good, good point. Yeah, CD into <laughs> CFP and then run make test. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so let's go on. So what we do for every test case is we create a namespace. And at the end of the test, we, we delete the namespace. When we delete the namespace, we clean up everything that is inside. We create a speaker with uh, all the information that we have in the test case. We do create and wait of the speaker, and then we run the asset, the asset function with the condition that we want. And for the first one, on what we do is we wait uh, to have the object with the finalizer. I will explain what is the finalizer. We wait to have the aspect with the finalizer, and then we wait for the speaker object to be ready. And for it to be ready, we need to, uh, to have the generation of the ready condition to be the same generation as the object, and we need the generation of the object to be the, just the one that is set in the status, to, to, be, to make sure that we are reconciling the right generation and that the ready condition represents the condition of the right generation. And then we make the assertion, uh, the as, uh, we, we uh, match, uh, we uh, look at the status condition to, to make sure it matches the condition that we are waiting for. So to test this, we can just do make test. Well, where am I? Yep, make test. And um, it found the test first.
Uh, just as a reminder about the, our progress bar, if we had a prog like a kind of Pizza Hut delivery progress bar on top, we're in step one of seven. And it'll just be each, each branch, or sorry, each tag that's checked out. So uh, it will, as I explained earlier, this will run the API and then make the test and clean everything at the end for you. So regarding this. One note, if you're using Gitpod. Oh, can Yeah, uh, if you're using Gitpod, you should go to the prepare K3S make um, terminal, not the, the shell, not the other one, okay? Not the one that automatically opens. Just go to the one above. That's all. What's the difference? The automatic one is the one at the bottom? Yeah, it opens on the wrong one that's not ah. um, uh, in the repo. Yeah. Okay. So. Okay. Now let's see what this does. Um, so what we have is, is a speaker reconciler. And what, we, um, what KeyBuilder does for us is create the speaker reconciler and it put a client. This is a client to to speak to the to the API server. So something to say about the client when he's speaking to the API server, he's speaking to the API server directly when it wants to create an, uh, something, an object, for example. But when it's reading uh, objects, it's always reading through the cache. It's not directly speaking to the API server for that. So we, are, we have uh, added an HTTP client to talk to our API. We set the controller name and to SFPI API, this is the endpoint. So we set it up with the manager. So we say that we watch this for an uh, object of type talks to on that speaker. That's for my API. Then uh, what we need to implement is the reconcile function that return a result on an error. So the result. Um, so at the end of the reconcile function, if you return uh, that reconcile has failed, what the controller runtime, the, the controller manager is going to us is he's going to queue uh, the object again for, for to be reconciled uh, after a, a backup. Uh, but uh, if we have no fa failure, we ha it's up to us to set whether we want to be queued again or not. So we can do it through the, resu the results. If you look at results, we can see that we have a VQ that is a Boolean, and we can set the VQ after that is the time. So we can set VQ after some time. So what we're going to do is, for this, when, when we have a new reconciliation that happened, we are going to retrieve the object that we are supposed to reconcile. So we do this uh, by getting a, a namespace name that we set the namespace and the name of the object that we want to, to retrieve and you use the client to retrieve it. And then what we're going to use is uh, we create a, um, a patch, that new helper. This is from Flux. What this is going to do for us is doing the, um, if you want to Patch an, uh, patch an object, like we have uh, retrieve an object to reconcile it, so we, we have changed some things, the status, the conditions, and we want to patch it. So we, the, what is the, the patch new helper doing us, is when it's doing the patch, is if there are any conflict, because uh, we are in a distributed system, so maybe some other controllers are acting on our objects as well, so the, the patch helper is going to resolve any conflict with that, that we have. In order to do that, is going to uh, what it is needed from us is to set the set of conditions that we own. So we, if you have conflict on those conditions that we own, it's going to ignore the, uh, the, the conflicts and go on and still patch the objects. Uh, so the conditions that we own are the ready condition, uh, reconciling this one, maybe I have to make this bigger. Reconciling this one, we uh, we said it to say that we are reconciling a given object. Like uh, the reconciliation process can uh, take several time. If you are reconciling an object and we have a failure, we requeue, and then when we uh, we uh, after the backup, we reconcile again. We are still in the reconciling reconciling process, so we we set the condition for that. 
stealth, uh, we said stealth, that means that there is nothing we can do and someone has to, um, so we need some human intervention uh, on that one. Here, we'll see what, when we, we, said, we said the failed one. And then we have create fail and update fail condition. So we have a different function. We have a different function that's when at the end, we, we, we make it a different function because we want no matter what happened after the reconciliation, reconciliation, we want this to be applied. So what we want to be applied is um, we said if we have a stale condition or a ready condition, we want to set the observed generation. This means that we, we are not in a reconciliation process anymore. We have finished either because it's stale or ready and we want to set in the status that the observed generation of uh, our reconciliation. And then we patch. That's what we do here in the defer function. The other thing we have to uh, do is uh, we set the finalizer. So here we have put a link if you want to know more about finalizers. When we set the finalizer, um, we add it to the object using a control and time function. But the finalizer is actually, let's see. If you did the proposal here, you can see the finalizers that we set. So, so this, we can set several finalizers. Those are the set of strings. And when, um, when the QBAP servers see those, if you do keep cuttle delete on the uh, keep cuttle delete proposal, when the QBAP server see those, it's gonna tell you, okay, the proposal has been deleted. But actually, the proposal is it's still in ATCD because it's not deleting it, because it's waiting for a, a controller to unset those finalizers before finally deleting it from ATCD. So if you take a total delete, the finalizer is still there. If you can, if you do a uh, get a proposal, you, you will still get the proposal until someone delete uh, the finalizer. What, what, we said this so we can do some pre-deletion. Here for the speaker, for example, when we do a delete speaker, cut -cut delete speaker, what we want to do on our side is uh, for the API server to tell us, okay, we're going to delete the speaker, uh, but we have a finalizer, what are we going to do about that? And on our side, what we do is we, we make an API call to delete the speaker from the API, and then we answer the finalizer. Yeah, uh, um, can we pause for a second just, does anyone have any questions so far? About, yeah. Uh, w one sec, let's get the mic. Yeah. And we're still on. This is probably a more yeah, generic question, question about the finalizer we're portion. Still but we're still uh, let's say your controller can't find, let's say you're managing like an external resource with a controller and the controller can't find the resource. Will it, is it better to stay within that finalizer loop and post an error? Or is it better to complete the finalizer and complete a deletion? Or does it depend? If you can't find a resource when you have set the finalizer? Yeah, let, let's say you're managing, let's say your controller is managing something completely separate, like in a yeah. cloud provider or something else, mm -hmm. and you can't find that. Just, just resource. like in this case where it's managing something within an external API. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Is it better to err on the side of caution and keep the CRD up in the finalizer state? Or is it better to just delete and say, okay, well, I can't find it. I'm not going to do any action. I'm going to delete myself. Well, this is the logic you have to implement somehow. Here, what we do is, uh, let me show you what we do. Do we still have the comment that shows the... Well, we have a, we don't have it in the, for now, we just put the final that we will see it later. But what you do on our side is we try to get, uh, to delete the object. If you get an, uh, an error, we still go on and, and remove the final result. But this is something you have to implement on your side. Gotcha, thank you. Uh, so, um, so, so yeah, we set the final result. And then we requeue. So it's not on the same uh, reconciliation uh, that we do we continue the reconciliation. When we set the finalizer, then we requeue after the backup, we, we continue the reconciliation. 
Then we, call, we, we, uh, we create a new client. And if the client is, if one trying to create of the HTTP client, something the, doesn't work. So what we do in new client is we look at the endpoint. If the endpoint is not a, a real endpoint, we, 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 we don't create it. Otherwise, we just set an HTTP client. And if this doesn't work because we, we don't have the right endpoint when we set up our manager to, uh, with, the, with the manifest, we mark it as failed. It means that someone has to uh, change this and recreate the, the controller. And then we do reconcile. We have an, an, an unexpected function reconcile. And this one is doing the actual reconciliation. So at the, end, at the beginning, we, we again have a defer function. And this defer function is going to deal with uh, all our conditions. What we start is that if we don't have a requeue of the result and we, if we don't have any uh, failure, we delete all the reconciling and negative polarity condition and you mark the reconciliation to true, the ready condition to true, setting that, okay, the reconciliation process is successful. Uh, we have a ready condition. If not, what we're going to do is see what type, what type of error we have that's coming from uh, our client that we have here. So in the client, uh, every time we do uh, an API call, we return a given type of error. And all the error we have here on given the method HTTP get on a speaker pass, we said we have an error of fetching the speaker, fetching the proposal, uh, updating the proposal speaker and or deleting, uh, de deleting, them, de deleting them, sorry. And then given a, an error, we can say you can mark conditions to true or to false. So uh, here we mark uh, if you have a, a creation uh, failure, you mark the create fail condition to true with the reason that we get from the error. And we mark the ready condition to false. So we will have a, an abnormal uh, polarity uh, to true and the ready condition to false. We do, uh, if, it's a, if it's a creation request, uh, or we set the ready condition to false only, and the default is just setting the ready condition to false. So, and here, if we are, if uh, the, object the object generation and the status observed generation differ, this means that we are on a new reconciliation because we have a new object generation. So we mark it as reconciling. And we, we go through the reconciliation, reconciliation process every time you have a failure until finally we, uh, we are successful. And if you are successful, at the end we, we delete it here. So that was a differ, uh, the differ function and setting the reconciling, and then we create the speaker. Creating the speaker is just making the, uh, creating a payload given what we have in the object and making the API call. We create it, and at the end, uh, what we do is we set up the ID in the status because it's successful. That was the first step. Question, maybe? Yeah, do you have a question or need help? Yeah, uh, okay, uh, give just a sec. There's a mic coming. Thanks. Sorry, just, uh, I guess, thinking up a little uh, further ahead, um, uh, more on the, I guess, metrics and observability side on the controller. Um, how are you guys kind of monitoring or understanding the efficiency of the controller or how, if it's running into specific errors or um, just to see, because sometimes you, you build stuff out and you think it's going to work out fine, but sometimes the metrics come back and it might not 
be as efficient or it's not doing the same things that you want it to do. So as far as like observability, where are you kind of putting that in? Okay, did you find? Um, I was just thinking we're setting. So we're setting we're setting events country, right on the the question. CRD. So with control yeah. uh, like with controllers, you have events and logs, right? So, um, it's running in the cluster as a pod, so you could log stuff. So. Con um, controller runtime comes with a logger, a standard logger that you know you could add the name of the custom resource that you're you're looking at and the namespace and then some extra messages. There's also an event recorder, so you could emit Kubernetes events. So those are like the top two ways. And then of course we're posting back to the status, which is also a way of communicating. So for you talked about the length of reconciliation. So you, with those things, is your application right? Um, those are now application specific, specific things that you know how to measure. You could use um, Prometheus, you could export some Prometheus mix, like with um, the Flux customized controllers, we try to measure how long it takes to reconcile resources. So we, those are now application specific, but majorly logs, events. Yeah. So you also uh, measure the disruptions of the API server to see uh, how the operator impacts to the uh, API server, right? Uh, yeah, because it's making calls, right? Um, so we, you could try to like if you, we defer our calls so that after it runs, of course it has to. There are some things it has to do. It has to update the object so that it can reflect back to who people getting, um, like running kubectl commands to see the updates. Those are things, but it should not be like making so much API calls that it runs it down. Yeah, and we really prefer that pattern um, with, with uh, Flux controllers, by the way, because it's just so useful for folks to get all of the information that they really need on the, C on the CRD itself. Move on. Um, So that was it for the first step. So I propose we move on to the second one. So to the same, just create a, a branch with the tag and move to that branch. Oh, so S2. Oh. Mm -hmm. On the difference we have here it is that we have a new test case. And this time you're going to update our speaker. So what we, we have here is that uh, we create the speaker the same way. And after creating the speaker, we are going to change the body of the speaker and expect the speaker to be updated and to be ready at the end. So you can run make tests the same way if you want to test this one. I'm just going to go over to code changes, additions. So what we have added here is, uh, no, we had this. What we have added is, in the reconcile part, we have new conditions. So now we have an error case for when we update the speaker. And here, before creating the speaker, we're going to check whether we have an ID in the status. If you have an ID in the status, it means that a previous reconciliation was successful and that the ID was set. If that's the case, it means we have to end, we have to handle the, the, the speaker update somehow. So, so what, that's what we do here in handle speaker update. Um, so we're going, going, we're going to create a payload with the new uh, spec of the object. And we are going to, to create the existing payload uh, using the, the, the ID. And then we are going to compare them. If they are not equal, we're going to make an API call to, to update the given, the given object. 
If it's successful, this means that uh, the update was successful. So we don't change the ID because the ID is, uh, is unique. So, but uh, you see here, this means that it's successful. And if it's successful, we just return. We don't go over the creation process. That's the, addition, that's the only addition we have for the update. So we can do make tests, make sure that everything works. And hopefully if you, if you do need to go back over some of this and say, what was that logic again? You can just look at the commits that we have here, which are separated into, you know, the first step was create speaker, this one's update speaker. And if you look at that commit, it shows pretty clearly with comments, like what, why all of those little bits of logic are there. Um, to handle the different cases. Um, question or need help? Okay. Does someone have a... Oh, some touch you. Do you have the um, mic still? Okay, cool. Right? Can you raise your hand again? Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, so if the controller is managing an external resource, right, something, say, like a GCS bucket, and uh, if that bucket gets updated uh, in a different way, maybe if I go through the console and if I say delete it, right? Does the reconciliation logic, like uh, when when does that uh, get triggered if I make such an external update? I think it's I, I, I'm having a really hard time hearing. Oh, okay. um, Sorry. Maybe, maybe in that so, scale. Uh, let's people's. say that we have a controller that manages a external resource like a GCS bucket. And um, so if I update the bucket externally, if I go through the Google console and if I update the bucket, um, does the reconciliation logic kick in at that point of time? Or do I need to update the CRD for the reconciliation logic to kick in? Do you want to take that one, Santosh? So he's saying, like, if you update the external resource, right, does the reconciliation kick in? So, like... <clears throat> Like, if you make a change on the API, does the controller automatically reconcile? So I could, like, it doesn't, right? It's basically, it reconciles at an interval, right, that you can set. And then it also reconciles when you make updates or updates to the object. So those are, like, the two things. So if you make a change to the external API without doing anything on the cluster, that will get reflected on its next run. So it, it won't be immediate. But you could, um, you could ask the, like, for example, in Flux, if you want to, like, we have a Flux reconcile command. So what it does is it adds an annotation to the resource. And the controller knows to watch out for that and trigger a reconcile. So yeah. So I think you can continue. Exactly, yeah. And, and there, there are ways to speed that up to be more consistent with, let's say, a push-based approach. Um, so instead of, you know, in, instead of waiting for that next interval, you could build, this is actually what some of, uh, um, let's say the, the Flux source controller does, is it also has a webhook to be able to, so let's just say when you make a git change in that case or some other source change, you can emit a webhook to say, oh, go ahead and check again because uh, we've updated it. So it will still be happening on the regular interval, but you can, you can issue a, a poke, and you could do that with any other API as well, if you wanted to build something like that in, if, let's say, it was really time sensitive and you wanted to hear events as well. Something, something we, want, we have to know here is, this is eventually consistent. What you, uh, if there is a failure when we do the update and the API call is, is failure to, to, because of net, network failure or there is something on the API, on our side, we don't well. We, we don't really care. I would say, but yeah, we can. We would set the condition saying, okay, for this reconcile, it's still not uh, okay. So we will set the condition that uh, that state that is still not okay. But eventually, if the APIs come back up and have uh, an, uh, the behavior that we expect, at the end we will set the condition saying, okay, finally we updated uh, your object and we we can set it in the conditions. Oh, we moving on because yeah we're the, we're at uh, we do the delete we got about ten minutes eleven minutes yeah I just do the delete 
I wonder if there are any steps that we could cut out. At least we could go through. Uh, so the, so the, the last part is about the deletion. Yeah. So, so we, the, same, the same way we have a test case to do the delete, and what we expect at the end is that the object is deleted. That uh, is not found when we try uh, to, pull, to, uh, to pull it to the API server. So th this is uh, set with our final. So we talked about the finalizer earlier. So it's stating that we cannot delete because we have the finalizer. Uh, what we do as well is before do we do the reconcile, we, we, we check when is uh, when is the deletion. You, when you do cup cuttle delete, there is something that is uh, there is a timestamp deletion timestamp that is set on your objects by JPS server. So if you have this timestamp, we we call uh, reconcile delete. And in reconcile delete, what we, what we do, we, we check if you have a status. And if you have a status ID, uh, it means that uh, we have a, a speaker that exists on, uh, on the API side. So we, we issue um, an API call to, de to delete that object, right? And, oh. I said that we, we go on and we remove the finalizer, but actually we don't. If, if it's, oh, if one, it's I'm not. so sorry. One, one, one thing. Did everyone check out um, step three, branch, the step three tag and make a branch from it? Uh, or you can just follow on, along on the screen, but if, you, if you're doing it, just make sure that you've done that. Sorry. Yeah. So actually what we do is we try to delete, and if we cannot delete, we don't delete the object on, uh, on Kubernetes side. We, we, we just continue after every back off trying to delete again until someone fixes it on the on the API side. But if the delete is successful, what we do is using control runtime, we remove the finalizer. So on the set of finalizer, we won't have any finalizer anymore. And then on the API, okay, API server, uh, and then we don't recur it actually because we, don't, we stop the reconciliation. And on the API, API server side, it can delete the object finally. So that's what we had here, and we're going to run make this for one last time. And so we won't have time to cover the proposal one, but it's rather the same, except for well, the there's a dependency, right? Yeah. So I'm going to show you this <coughs> before. So I'm going till the end directly. Step seven. Um, question? Yeah, just a question around update versus delete. <laughs> so when we get the event where on the first time where the timestamp is set to non-zero, meaning that the object's been deleted, is that an update event to our cube controller reconciler or is that a delete event? Um, you know we have a queue, so if something is happening at the same time, anyway. Uh, okay, but but for the purposes of your um, predicate to filter out update versus delete events, what would it be triggered as? Uh, for the purposes of your predicate, because your predicate is is like filtering out, but it. it in this case, we're returning true for both update and delete events. But I'm just curious, like, you know, if I'm writing a controller and I want to say filter out deletes because I don't care, but I want to get update events and maybe do something different for that scenario. Um, you can take the question up to. Would it? Yeah. Would there be a distinction there? Because I guess, like, does delete fire only when the object's actually removed from API server? Um, versus, I think you're going like, to cover the this time in the logic. I cover it in logic, yeah. Yeah, well, maybe, um, thanks we for that one. We're, we're, I think we're going to address that as we go through the logic okay. and, and let us know if it doesn't. Cool, okay. Yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> thanks. And we can talk about it at the, at the end uh, as well. Um, so the proposal, uh, quickly before uh, we finish. Uh, on the proposal, what we do, we do the same exact same things. We create a proposal, we update the proposal, and we delete the proposal. There are, but there are some differences uh, that I'm going to explain quickly. 
The difference is that we have is in order to create a proposal, we need to have a speaker. So what we do uh, when we try and that would to be in step four. You check out the S four brand. This step four, but I'm at the end. I explain everything because we don't have time. Cool. Uh, we we try to get the speaker first. If we don't have the speaker, we cannot create a proposal, and we set the condition say, stating why we cannot create a proposal. If the speaker exists, we can then uh, create the proposal and reference the speaker. On the API side, we have a validation when we try to create a proposal. We validate that the reference speaker exists. That's the first thing that is different. Um, the second thing that is different is on the watch side. So what we have added, uh, what we want to do is every time we have a, an update on the speaker side, you want to be notified that the speaker has been updated and you want to update our proposal accordingly. So the way we do this is, as I mean said, that we have a cache where we, from the informer when we watch API server for events, we put those objects in our cache. And you want to index in our cache those objects so we can retrieve them. So we index them by a speaker index that we call metadata, the speaker name. We index them so we can retrieve them done. Okay, so we have a function that is called index proposal by speaker. What we're going to do is retrieve a given proposal and uh, index by, by the speaker fan's name, the sp speaker that is owning this proposal. Then what we do is when we uh, set up our manager, what we want to do as well, we set it for proposal, but we want to watch, his, to want to watch the speakers as well. So we watch the speakers saying every time there's an update on speaker, we want to watch this and handle, handle those, uh, the requeue for the speaker. And when we, handle, we do uh, this, we set up our own function for handling this that we call request for speaker change. Uh, and in request for speaker change, what we do is we check if it's a speaker. And if it's a speaker, we check uh, the ID and then uh, we retrieve all the proposals that have this given ID uh, as, a, as a key in the index. And for, the, for all those ones that we retrieve, we, uh, we, ask for, uh, we ask to reconcile those ones. We have a loop where we reconcile those. So uh, those are the differences, everything here is on step seven and we have everything in main actually. In main you have everything written and you can uh, go from there with the tests. What we have as well is that I didn't say we have the deploy target somewhere. We have a deploy target here. Uh, Good to mind. Uh, and in deploy, in deploy, what we do is we have um, we have an image that contains the controller, and if you do uh, make deploy, you can install everything, the API and the controller in your in your um, in your given uh, Kubernetes cluster. That's it. Um, we, Okay, yeah, um, I think we had, did, I don't know if your question was actually answered about the deletion. I think you were asking, if I got it right, how does the reconcile function in the speaker controller, um, or sorry, yeah, how does the reconcile function know if it's a deletion or not? Did I get that right, as opposed to an update? And I think if I'm understanding correctly, um, the, uh, Basically, if there's a deletion timestamp, then we know that it's a deletion. Otherwise, it's not. Got it. Yeah, and, and in fact, that's in, let's see, lines 142 to one. Basically, yeah, there's a comment about that in line 141, and then there's a there's an if statement in there inside of the speaker controller. That was, Go. That wasn't his question. His Wait, question was is that, that question? we have. The question was. Oh. I'm assuming that like, the deletion timestamp gets added. That's an update. Um, I'm just wondering the distinction is when the 
Well, I think it doesn't matter. But on, a, on the control side, you have a queue. So you have all requests that are coming through the queue. And you, for every request, you try to get, to get the object anywhere. So if it's not anywhere, anymore there, you don't do anything. And on the API server as well, you do the same. You try to get from each CD, from ATCD to get the object. If the object is not here, there anymore, nothing happens. So you first check oh. the object, and if it's not there anymore. Let's change this a bit here. When we're getting, <laughs> yeah, we, we did that to do. Cool. Okay, so, uh, yeah. uh, well, we can talk about it just after the two, two, yeah. Okay, cool. Well, can we are actually time? at the end of our time. Um, I hope everyone got was able to get through a part of this tutorial, and you can still access those instances for a period of time. Uh, I mean, I don't know how long they're going to be available for. Do you know the Git pod? Uh, so by, I think by default it's one hour. Oh, okay. The community. So the community uh, edition for Git pod, if I'm not mistaken, I might, maybe I'm saying a mistake. Yeah, you know how much? Sorry, what? You know how much the session is going to stay? Like how long after? How long? No, no, um, the, the GitPod session. The but actual GitPod instances. 30 minutes, it's not one hour, okay. 30 minutes. Okay, cool. So, so, uh, so you can also go through that again. Um, I believe correct. We don't have a specific time limit after they can do this. I just wanted to let people know what the next steps are. Yeah, you can either watch it again, you can do it again. I, I think you can do it on GitHub again, but uh, either way, you can certainly run it locally and, um, and follow uh, steps all the way to seven and see each of the comments for this. So I hope that, I hope that helps a lot. And thanks everyone. Um, thanks, for, thanks to the GitPod folks and, um, and uh, all of you for coming.